Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some of the ideas behind the Fermi Paradox. And this is a series of videos I've been meaning to make for a pretty long time, but unfortunately never really got to it. And in this case we're actually going to discuss various ideas, several ideas as a matter of fact, and if the time permits, I'm going to try to release at least one part every single week. And so for the next few weeks you're going to be hearing more and more ideas, mostly research-based ideas, but also a little bit of opinions, on what we believe about the Fermi Paradox and why exactly we still haven't really heard from anyone out there. Why, even today, there is really no strong evidence at all for the existence of any extraterrestrial intelligence anywhere out there. So where is everyone and why is nobody talking to us? Or why is nobody visiting? And in this video we're going to focus on a little bit of history and also talk about one idea, one explanation, known as the Zoo Hypothesis. But I guess first let's establish what we mean by the Fermi Paradox in terms of the actual definition. Well, it's actually kind of simple to understand. It's the discrepancy between what's expected and what's observed. For example, the iconic Drake equation by the late Frank Drake, or really any other similar equation or similar principle, have always suggested that there should be at least a few advanced extraterrestrial civilizations somewhere in the vicinity within our galaxy. This was of course based on the ideas of knowing how many stars there are, how many stars might contain Earth-like planets, and how likely water might exist around those planets. And of course, a few other factors as well. And so if similar conditions to Earth may lead to some complex life, by now we should have heard from someone. Which was one of the questions asked by Enrico Fermi during a casual conversation in the summer of 1950 while talking to his fellow physicists responsible for the Manhattan Project. Apparently the scientists were discussing the idea of UFOs and aliens, and at some point Fermi said, but where is everybody? Which eventually led to this so-called Fermi paradox. And so if planets similar to Earth can exist somewhere else, and if they can also acquire similar conditions, at least statistically, we expect similar results. Moreover, even if these civilizations have long gone extinct, and even if we can travel across space only at very slow velocities, once again statistically, at least some of these civilizations could have already traveled across the entire Milky Way for many millions of years. Which means that, at least in theory, some of these ancient civilizations should have visited Earth at some point, or maybe at least sent some of their probes. But once again, no evidence of any of this, no evidence of ancient aliens, any probes, no convincing evidence of anything ever happening. Lots of claims, lots of suggestions, but nothing convincing, nothing concrete. And that's of course where the scientists are still scratching their heads. Where is everybody after all? Ok, so what are some of the possible answers? So even though Fermi is technically attributed as the first person to ask this question, it was asked even before him. Not surprisingly, one of the first publications of this idea and this question was from the father of rocketry, Tsiolkovsky. He wrote a manuscript in 1933 where he mentioned that people generally deny the existence of intelligent beings on other planets. However, if such beings existed, they would have visited Earth or at least given us a sign that they exist somewhere out there. But for some reason, we hear no such communication and see no aliens showing their presence. And so he proposed a solution known as the Zoo Hypothesis. Even though it's usually attributed to John Allen Bell, Tsiolkovsky proposed this over a decade prior. Although the actual name Zoo Hypothesis was coined by John Ball. And the idea is, of course, really simple. It suggests that humans are not yet ready for aliens to talk to us. Or basically, the alien life avoids communication with Earth because we're just not ready for it yet. They may be observing us, they may be looking at us how we're evolving over time, and they're trying to essentially allow for natural evolution that in theory could take us closer to being able to communicate with aliens themselves. Although potentially they also don't want to visit because there's a chance for some kind of an interplanetary infection or some kind of an interplanetary contamination that could endanger everyone. So basically they think we're too primitive or are just not ready for communication yet. We might have to cross some kind of a barrier in terms of technology or in terms of our ability to control ourselves before some sort of a civilization will finally make contact, announcing themselves to the world and potentially connecting us to every other species in the galaxy. Although in some more cynical explanations of this idea, we're not just the animals in a zoo, we're also basically lab rats. So certain scientists thought that maybe we're also being experimented on. Naturally, because this is something we do to animals as well. Either way, the suggestion here is that there is some kind of a zookeeper, or I guess a lab worker, that controls our access to communication with the rest of the galaxy. And well, yeah, that's 
pretty much the premise of Star Trek and the guiding principle of Prime Directive. Lots of different super advanced civilizations, but all of them basically staying relatively quiet, allowing more primitive civilizations to evolve themselves and to acquire necessary concepts to then join some kind of a council. But right there, that's the main problem with this proposition and this idea. Council, or some kind of a guiding principle that's controlled by a major civilization in the entire galaxy, the Zookeeper. And so the problem here is that everyone obeys the Zookeeper or everyone follows the lead of one individual civilization, potentially the first civilization, that requires these rules to be obeyed. But any rogue civilization that decides to go against the rules can actually undo everything all at once. And the chance of this happening within a few million years of the existence of humans is actually relatively high. So either there are very few civilizations in the entire galaxy, making the chance for these rogue civilizations to exist very low, or the zookeeper has a lot of power over everyone, potentially representing some kind of a galactic autocrat that nobody dares to disobey. But there are obviously some additional propositions here as well. For example, maybe the original civilization that established all of this is already long gone. And this has now become a kind of a tradition that everyone seems to follow. On the other hand, maybe the final step of evolution for all advanced civilizations is basically some kind of a super advanced AI or some kind of a super advanced robotic life that simply follows all of the commands without disobeying. Which of course means that the zookeeper in this case would be a super advanced artificial intelligence. Or maybe all civilizations eventually evolve very similar cultural standards and ultimately all agree to this idea of zoo hypothesis. They all agree not to interfere with lower civilizations. This will be kind of similar to what happens on Earth with convergent evolution, where, for example, we get different species evolving into crabs. This happened many, many times over millions and millions of years. The video about this is, by the way, in the description below. But once again, this assumes that everyone evolves the same, or everyone becomes the zookeeper of its own. Yet even in evolution or in cultural development, there are always exceptions. There should be exceptions here as well. At least one civilization should have already broken the rules by now and should have already announced itself a long, long time ago. And so when it comes to the zoo hypothesis, a lot of things just don't add up. As a matter of fact, a lot of scientists believe that this idea is very speculative and seems to actually be based on our own biases, including theological biases or ideas of autocracy and control. But more importantly, it's an idea that's kind of untestable, which surely makes it somewhat unscientific. It also makes a lot of very biased assumptions about ideals and goals of other civilizations if they exist, and more importantly, ignores the simple fact. The galaxy is really large, and the light travels at the limited speed. If there was some kind of a control imposed by a large civilization, it would be impossible to control the entire galaxy without someone, at some point, breaking the rules. And so unless separate civilizations across the entire galaxy were doing the same thing for some unknown reasons, it makes zoo hypothesis a little bit less likely than a lot of other propositions we're going to discuss later on. Or to be more specific, it makes the zoo hypothesis the least likely explanation to the Fermi paradox we're going to be discussing in this series. But I still wanted to start with it because it was one of the first ever proposed. But on that note, that's pretty much it. We're going to be discussing other theories in the upcoming videos, so make sure to subscribe, share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye. Okay, something else I wanted to add before I finish this video. In the last few decades, there were several detections of potential signals from extraterrestrial intelligence, with some even called Little Green Men, or LGM, because they could not be explained at that particular time. But with time and with further analysis, every single one of those signals was determined to be of natural cause and moreover even led to some really incredible discoveries, like in this case right here. This was the first ever confirmation of an actual pulsar. LGM-1, Little Green Man 1, turned out to be the first pulsar ever discovered. With the most recent detection of a potential signal we've discussed in the video in the description being the one from the Chinese FAST telescope, that was also at some point referred to as a potential alien signal that within just a few days was determined to be of earthly origins, or actually more likely orbital origins. And just to repeat myself, as of right now, there have been no confirmed scientific evidence of anyone ever talking to us in terms of radio signals, in terms of any kind of extraterrestrial communication, 
or anything that was definitively a source coming from a different civilization somewhere out there. And even though there are still some unexplained signals, none of them have ever been confirmed, some of them have never been seen again, or have given us enough evidence or knowledge that this was definitively coming from an alien source. But it's still worth exploring and still worth talking about. But anyway, more on this later. <laughs>